to introduce to you Dr. S. Ama Ray. Good afternoon. It's my absolute delight to be here with you today. I'm grateful to Amy Fitterer for making this invitation possible and for Janelle Ion for igniting the possibility. Thank you. So you've made it. We've arrived at the closing plenary. Thank you for staying for the duration. Conference fatigue is real. And not only that, who is S. Amare anyway? Here is a glimpse of a recent work. My name's S. Amare. I'm a choreographer, I'm a teacher, and I'm also the creator of Embodyology. Higher Knowledge is the most recent choreography that I've made. And that piece came about because I had an interest in making a statement about the current state of the so-called development of humanity. We have so much technological development, but in terms of our humanity, I question where we are. So I wanted to make a piece that made uh, an intervention or raised questions and gave the cast and myself an opportunity to explore those questions. So the Anthropocene is what is described as the era that we're living in. This moment where we as humans are using technology to drive and define the spaces that we live, work and breathe in. And it also really articulates the way in which we are using our resources on the earth in such a way that it's not sustainable. So the piece has three principal groups of performers, the earth and natural indigenous life, the corporations and everyday people, and then we have the white coats, the scientists, the, those that measure and determine the value of that which comes from the earth and, and place it into another context. So there are these three groups that are in dialogue. The improvisation um, in this process of developing this work gave me the options to bring these groups together in, in, a, in experimental ways in the beginning. So in the rehearsal process, we're actually dressed in a version of what you see on, in, on the stage. The performers were embodying their characters or what they were representing in terms of this triptych of, of, of different spaces. I was giving a lot of that agency back to the performers who, understanding what their role was, they were then able to uh, produce novel ideas which I was then able to weave in and craft into certain aspects of the work. The urgency of this piece is that it's a dialogue that we should be engaging with daily and those people at the highest table need to receive this message or messages like this that, that enable them to enter the dialogue in a new way also. And so it's about listening and it's about paying attention and getting that message to those uh, that have you know, the, the political power, the economic power. When does this become the top of the list? When is, when is the alarm ringing loud enough for everyone to say, okay, let's pay attention, let's regroup, 
Let's make new decisions that may be challenging, but need us to go, go in that direction. The future of higher knowledge in the Anthropocene is seeing this piece on companies that have an international uh, reputation and that are interested in, in issues, in issue-based work. So a courageous company that's ready to take on and find the support for this kind of work. Because that's the other thing, is that this work, you know, it is challenging to the status quo. There's no two ways about that. But I think art has a role to play at, at the forefront of raising consciousness because as artists we are in, a, in an amazing place to, to begin provocations and I think our, our audiences in the arts deserve the opportunity to, to engage deeply as well. Thank you. So a recent walk uh, between the spaces of science, indigenous people, nature and corporate interests. So I've just come back from the fourth annual conference of artificial intelligence for good at the United Nations in Switzerland. The conversations there were focused on where artificial intelligence meets to advance the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. These are goals that we might also address across the fields of dance. And today, I have created a presentation that prepares three main topics that reflect or interact with our US dance ecologies in various ways. The first theme, and thereafter, a constant undercurrent, is the subject of improvisation as a performance tool and a tool of analysis, and furthermore, considering it as a phenomenon stoking our lives. There is so much that is unpredictable in our field, both in the sense of the new and unexpected opportunities, but also in the realm of the catastrophic. I've dedicated, I've dedicated a great portion of my artistic life and all of my scholarly effort to practicing and articulating improvisation. I pursue it academically to create access to a culturally inclusive practice, as well as amalgamating it as a tool for expediting choreography. And I can, t I can attest that there are values that lay within this field of knowledge that can serve and, and support our organizational as well as personal development. I'm introducing you to a new paradigm, a paradigm of improvisation that I created through my engagement with indigenous peoples that stems from the body, but does not only apply to the body. It's called embodyology. I'll just go back a slide. It's unlikely that you've heard of this before. Have you not been in one of my audiences before now? Embodyology is focused on embodied communication, and I was examining structures that I found in Eve and Yoruba practices that then informed the principles. It has nothing to do with codified African dance steps, and everything to do with indigenous people's value systems. I've taught these principles to dancers and non-dancers from many different aesthetic and cultural backgrounds across North America, Europe, and also back in Ghana. I continue strategically working in Ghana with local people in Kopea village, researching to uncover yet more nuance concerning the flow of embodied communication. Reckoning on these gargantuan discoveries, I immediately registered this as intellectual property to ensure a commitment and a mechanism for redistributing the resources back to this community. Not only is this reasonable and respectful in view of what Western societies and researchers like me continue to do in, in the form of extraction of, of resources from the continent of Africa, it is crucial. 
If we look more locally here in the USA, significant innovations in the world of concert and commercial dance originate from peoples and communities that neither understand their influence or see the impact of their creativity. I have a question for you, but before you can answer it, I point you to the analog technology that I provided you with today. You've received a V. You should have your, your paper, and this is what it's going to translate to. This means yes, and this means no. This means maybe, and this means need more information. Let's go through it again. Yes? No. Maybe. Need more information. Okay, great. We have the science. We've got the data set. Okay. So it's a multi-purpose symbol. So, the second topic I'll share is some further examples of how I've engaged dance to deepen our call to serve humanity's highest good. The opening video is the only video that I will show. The hope is that it might ignite your imagination as to how or what action to take or to make space for. Collectively, we span from those whose central artistic foci, foci is are allied to reflect social and environmental justice. There are those of you that run organizations seeking to engage more substantively, and there are those of you for whom a deep and particular mission has not yet arisen. The Artificial Intelligence Conference, I'm really just here as a funnel to share with you what I gleaned and the beginnings of my percolations. Much is being actioned by Dance USA, highlighting the role dance plays in advancing a just society. We agree dance is manifold. It can be purely aesthetic, narrative, abstract, or socially thematic. And I also acknowledge that all modes do not appeal to everyone. Art, in our case dance, is expansive being experienced by more people now than ever before. Dance is returning to its vital purpose of healing and leading as a mode of social reconciliation, actioned by artists that are compelled to propel our understanding of connectedness to one another. Humanity's impact on the globe has reached a critical point, and many of us would agree that now more than ever, we need to bring and identify our common goals. Dance has a unique way to bring attention to social ills. The beauty of dance enables us to bypass some of the filters that rhetoric, that more traditional modes of discourse can erect. We can literally touch the hearts and follow this with a flood of sensory and emotional tendrils that make new synaptic connections possible. This, I think, is a special type of power. In conversation with Amy Fitterer these past few months, I've heard her use the conjunction of dance and power several times. What if we collectively occupied this identity? Could we step into new confidence, in a vision of being at the leading edge of change in the world, respecting our planet and all peoples on it. Referenced constantly at the UN conference, let's consider the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of these, and I've just selected five for us to review in relation to dance. Zooming out to see what choices we can make in relation to the greater world may help us to take concerted action. What happens in the US impacts the world at large. Therefore, we are in sharp relief. And here is the fifth. So, I've been a professional in this field for 30 years. 20 of those were centered in the UK. 
For many of those years, I was a company dancer, dancing in the works of Jane Dudley, Paul Taylor, Mark Morris, Ohan Naharin, Robert Cohan, Dan Wagoner, Christopher Bruce, and the like. I now continue as a professor of dance, slash choreographer, slash physical theatre director, slash improviser, slash scholar. In my own terms, I'm a performance architect. Self-definition has always been important to me. Labels and categories imposed from the outside are often insufficient. Susan Melrose speaks of the expert spectator, dance scribes, and their partiality to words, having such great impact to sway opinion, direct policy, and resources. Labels are often used to unconsciously instill or maintain hierarchies, hierarchies that marginalize, but resisting them, as I do, comes with its own problem. Society as a whole likes boxes, labels, measuring and comparing. It makes things simple and manageable. It is, however, not the place of innovation. The arts are no different and often more resistant to change. This theatre is a beautiful space, but the ethnographer in me begs the question, why was it modelled to replicate 18th century Europe? Does it speak to who the space was designed to emulate? If indigenous Americans were to design a space for cultural edification, what would that look like? So while dancing with London Contemporary Dance Theatre, I learned and performed Jane Dudley's harmonica breakdown. In some ways, this was my first entry point into understanding that social justice and dance were strategic partners. Harmonica breakdown depicts the life of the poor, the working classes, the rural peoples migrating to escape the harsh realities of the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. This solo was made in 1938. People moving from the known, from the to the unknown, to survive and continue to encounter life struggles and triumphs. After my time with LCDT, I joined Rombert Dance Company. I continued to perform at major dance houses like Sadler's Wells, the Joyce Theatre, Marinsky Theatre Pet Petersburg and the like, but continued to be coached by Dudley in harmonica, performing it eventually and teaching it to companies in Europe, performing it in New York, and at the retrospective when Anna Sokolov and Pearl Primus were present, and later at City Center. During these early years of my performing career, in tandem, I began by Happenstance, Jazz Exchange Music and Dance Company, after my first trip to New York City. And that was in 1992. I wanted to make a bold statement about jazz dance and music, and their innate connectedness. In its truest form, jazz is both generated and optimized by improvisation. The genealogy of jazz, like no other creation, is, is a ratified product of the United States. This creativity as manifest in jazz and tap, however, remains only partially developed theatrically. A pejorative, perhaps due to their natal beginnings in the exploitative blackface minstrelsy spaces of burlesque and maybe the social spaces like ballrooms and nightclubs that are seen as less spaces of learning. And furthermore, jazz dance is most often deployed in association with commerce and entertainment, branded as lowbrow spaces. This jazz dance nucleus is the same embodied intelligence that has bifurcated and spawned a plethora of dances that show up today under the hip-hop umbrella. Many of us recognize the impact of breaking, popping on the contemporary ballet aesthetic. Hip-hop's global dispersal shows up as K-pop in Korea and boomerangs back from Nigeria as Afrobeat. I venture here in these opening remarks not simply to give a nod to jazz dance at Dance USA, but also to point out that Jane Dudley used movements stemming from African-American vernacular, such as the cakewalk, 
in her work and trenches. And she went further by underpinning this movement with the folk music of African-American harmonica player, Sonny Terry. We are all driven by rhythm. And this was the technology that Dudley used to create her powerful dance. Undoubtedly a seminal work, Jane received lifelong recognition for this very short dance, three minutes and 42 seconds. I often wonder whether if this were a creation of Dunham's or Prima's, would it have re received such durable remarks? Since 2001, on behalf of her estate, I have been the custodian of Harmonica Breakdown. And as a result of relocating here to the US, I have a greater grasp of its socio-political significance, both then in 1938 and now. Learning of Dance USA's celebration of, Dan of Diane McIntyre's innovative, innovative work was literally music to my ears. I finally had a chance to sit and talk with her this week. I studied her work whilst researching improvisationist performance for my PhD. I was looking for diversity of approach. She definitely brought a different set of sensibilities into this space, working with dancers and musicians in tandem. And many people to this day are not cognizant that improvisation is a central part of her genius. The ecology of jazz music and its DNA of embodiment is what shaped her creative endeavors. Learning, although after the fact that I wasn't a lone soldier, was really exciting in this terrain. As I spoke to her, she reflected on the fact that people commonly are unaware that she has this definitive approach. And that was intentional. She remarked also, what is this type of improv, she said, when they touch each other? <laughs> I said, contact improv. And to, to that, she said, yes, we were doing that five years before the postmodern folks came out with the name. <laughs> so that was very interesting to me. And I will do further research into that space. One of my mentors who recognized what I had begun doing in the UK is Wynton Marsalis. He encouraged me to come to the USA to pursue my work. This image is from a lecture performance that I was part of and a consultant on a few years ago. In this context, he strove to understand the historical relationship between the development of jazz music and dance from the 18th to the 20th century a course through which race, legislation, access, and cultures collided with opportunity. Along with Jared Grimes and other dancers, we improvised within key, section, key sections of this four-hour lecture performance. As mentioned earlier, embodyology is a term I created to articulate an emergent field the study of human performance. It contains six inter in interconnected circulatory systems that coalesce and process to produce improvisation as performance. There is a difference. With much dedication, these sensibilities and layers of awareness can be accessed and learned. The model can be used to analyze phenomena that utilize improvisation as a dynamic responsive system. So, back to your analog technologies. Do you or your organization ever improvise? We have almost a full house, I am just letting you know. I wish I had my camera to take up a picture of this moment. We have a house of improvisers. I am in good company. Thank you. It's something that's most underrecognized, yet it, it keenly is part of what we must do to live this life. And if we become more uh, dedicated and intentional about what that is, we can find new possibility. In 2003, I challenged myself to bring audiences collectively into the realm of improvisation using technology. 
And using cell, cell phone technology, Fleece Siegel and I built an interactive platform. And over an 11-year period, we created a number of different pieces of work. There was a, a work called Seasons, whereby I worked with a differently abled composer, Sonia Alori, and mixed ability performers who examined the progressive relationships between microaggressions and torture. I think for me, however, the most important work with this technology was Tex Territory Congo. This was a dance theatre piece that walked the audience through feeling the impact of our technological consumption on beleaguered, strife-ridden countries uh, in Central Africa, the Democratic Republic of the Congo in particular. This is a country that mines coltan and cassiterite that keeps our devices functioning. This is a space that's also in extreme turmoil, but somehow the mineral exports continue unabated. The child exploitation is catastrophic. And the performance served to rid the audience of that ignorance, of that crisis. It goes on today. I continue with that campaign. I also created um, a work, or several works, in which I was the director, um, works written by Mojisola Adebayo. Two of her works were entitled Moj of the Antarctic and Muhammad Ali and Me. And they're theatrical works that really connect the transatlantic connection and the diasporic relationship that we have. Jazz, the house that America built, was really in response to this current political space that we are in. Uh, the silence was quite uh, arresting. I felt there were not enough people speaking about what was happening, and I needed to express what I felt and what I could see happening. And these are the works that I created using Embodyology as a choreographic method increasing awareness of black LGBTQI issues, xenophobia, immigration, religious persecution, and the transatlantic trading of humans. On seeing the 31 artists selected for Dance USA's fellows, we can see that they collectively occupy these spaces and more. But how confident are we as a community that dance can take a leading role in changing the world into a more heart-centered one? How can we, or can we, reduce proportions of men and women living in poverty? Can we create sound policy frameworks based on pro-poor and gender-sensitive strategies? Can we ensure healthy lives and promote well-being? How can we do this and be rewarded for it? What partners are needed? Ensuring women's full, effective participation in business and trade and equal opportunities. How are dance organizations facilitating the advancement of women? And uh, goal 16, supporting effective, accountable and transparent institutions at all levels. How do we ensure responsive, inclusive, participatory and representative decision-making. How are we listening to our audiences, our students, our customers, our dancers, our aspirational audiences in all of those spaces? And how are we participating in ensuring that our youth have relevant skills? Is this even something that we should be pursuing? Is this outside of our realm? Do we have a... a a role to play. No doubt some of the language doesn't fit in such exacting ways. But I have no doubt that many dance, I'm just going to go back a for a moment, um, but I've no doubt that many dance-centered organizations and artists are engaging in these goals directly. And perhaps we can use them to ask ourselves, are we fully using our potential to impact the world around us? So now let's center on the rigors of improvisation. Yes, I said rigor. Well, for some time, the word improvisation, and for some, is the opposite of rigor. It suggests that anything goes, a lack of structure, a lack of cohesion. So 
Now, who holds a torch for improvisation in the context of rigor? Okay. Yes, we have many torch bearers. Need more information? I think I would opt to be in that group too. More information is coming. I would suggest a parallel word for us to think about is thinking about creativity. Creativity. Improvisation is creativity. So, artificial intelligence is taking up more and more of the predictive decision-making that runs our lives based on the exacting That's standards that are predetermined concentrated on and perhaps overdetermined. I intuit that there will be an increasing need for people, dancers, choreographers, leaders, instructors really who can effectively think beyond the limits of what and AI and, we, and machine learning produce for us as outcomes. And one way of highlighting that I ponder, where does this live performance live in the future space? Children born in this decade will not have anything like the same social experiences as their parents, never mind their grandparents. Distinctively, human capacities such as experiencing empathy and opening of the imagination are not calculable within the current AI mathematical frameworks of machine learning and AI. To attach himself to it. We have to examine it really carefully and I think art helps us to do this. It calibrates our perception. While these machines can do quantum calculations, their engineering has developed out of mathematical models that frame intelligence as logic, we are all chess playing together. logic. Every government, company, university, international institution, civil society, organization, and every single one of us should consider how best to work together to ensure AI serve as a positive force for humanity. So that's it from us. As far as I can tell, embodied cognition does not yet inform these innovations that are at the root of AI. Rest assured, although they are trying, with millions of dollars of research projects, robots will not be walking the Earth at any time soon. On the other hand, machine-human augmentation this convergence is fiercely making its way into a range of industries. A trillion dollar industry awaits people who will pay huge, huge sums to have access to superhuman brain capacities, to maintain advantage and dominate others, and make new settlements on other planets, as Prosodom Alk alluded to in th on Thursday's presentation. Am I digressing? Yes? No? Maybe? Am I digressing? Maybe? Need more information? Okay, we've got a mixed medley, great. So we're thinking about what I am sharing, okay. So let's get back to our business. We are organizations that do business around live, real-time settings. Who and how many people will occupy these settings is a question two generations from now. Who will be here? How will future generations find their way to theaters when their devices will serve up exactly what they want without them going anywhere at all? In a keynote address at the UN, someone flippantly said, a speaker, a keynote speaker, said that humans are disposed to be lazy. Yes? No? Maybe? We've got more no's here than yes. Interesting. He was quite emphatic, though flippant. And 
with that idea, just holding the idea that, that technology is about making things accessible, for, so that make, making things more convenient, adding changing demographics to the picture, the challenge of maintaining or indeed advancing access to these spaces for all is further enlarged. There is a possible future scenario where instead of going to a theatre like this, our children's children will marvel at the artistry and technical prowess through pixel-perfect recreations of choreography experienced in 3D. Western classical dance works will be offered for a child to experience through virtual or augmented reality from the comfort of their homes. Is it time to innovate new dance experiences, both in the modes of spectatorship and participation, to find exceptional ways to heighten a person's edification of the live experience? How will this happen if hierarchical structures that have maintained a culture of worthy and less worthy dance practices remains unchanged? Many would assert that it's time to educate st stakeholders about the power, going back to Amy's power, that dance has, Dance USA has, to transform our societies and literally heal medical ills as well as social ills if we do our best, our collective inclusive work. Imagine for a moment, what if new hospitals or wellness institutes were built to include performance theatres, workshops, class space and rehearsal spaces? And where else must we go, lazy or not, to be able to be part of the world? How could we make performance accessible and directly interfaced in these spaces? What if wellness institutes were the new multi-purpose venues? my falling robots. So, doctors in the UK are already prescribing dance with a view to a full rollout by 2023 of other art offerings. But there is a caveat. Mark Rowland, the chief executive of the Mental Health Foundation, adds that accessibility is another obstacle. Our concern is that social prescribing options, music, dance and volunteering, aren't being accessed by the poorest in our community. If we're going to make the biggest difference to prevention and recovery, the government needs to show how it will reach the most at risk. In the USA, the National Institute of Health is integrating arts into research. And I suspect that medicine here in the US will have similar challenges to the UK, but also different ones. And with the information that is out there, we could see that the arts could actually take a lead on countering the normal vertical channels to access. The music research that's largely be d being done through the NIH is largely being done through fMR fMRI technologies, which doesn't afford the movement of the body. Future innovations need to include dance, and some physiologists, psychologists, are beginning to do this. My vision is to be part of an interdisciplinary group that will examine the efficacy of rhythm and bodyology's meta-principle. Without a doubt, there is a whirlwind of change coming. Attending the AI for Good felt like I was being part of a 21st century gold rush. Actually, it's a coal town rush, driven by the need to find new modes of consumption. Predictive technologies have a handle on your purse, quite literally. A new term has been coined by Roger McNamee, surveillance capitalism. In view of the AI imposition, the future of our field, like many others, is unknown. But what we do know is that change is coming. And for the most of us, the space where we're already encountering this is in the social media space. We know that young dancers' use of social media and screen time is extremely high. And in terms of the professional field, in the commercial realm, dancers are more and more being selected via social media due to their status as influencers. We also know that schools, companies, choreographers and teachers are being assessed by their gram 
media posts, likes, and new feed, news feed contents. In the commercial field, there are a growing number of production companies taking calculated risks, hiring dancers that have little to no professional experience because they come with a readily accessible group of followers in the realms of hundreds of thousands to whom they can market their brands to very directly that fit a specific demographic. This is the reality. This is also causing tension in the industry, research that a, a, a graduate student at UCI has just completed. In addition, there is a great deal of misinformation circulating throughout social media, with too few ways to detect what is actually real or fake. Let me share an example with you. This comes from the conference. Like so, my shaky hand. Even if they would never say those things. So, for instance, they could have me say things like, I don't know, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or <coughs> How about this? Simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. <laughs> now, see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone, like Jordan Peele. So to make that video, you need a very high quality so, voice actor. So that was Jordan Deep well, fakes. Taking this source of and mapping his dance moves onto the target. You can see the sources here. So the original dance, as you can see, is on the right. The deep fake has been created. And it's not an animation. It appears as a fully, fully as a as a human figure. It's not an animation. Has anybody engaged with the Nancy Pelosi video that's recently been shared and the Mark Zuckerberg deep fakes? Has anybody heard of this term, deep fakes? Who has not yet heard of deep fakes? Can you keep your... Okay, so these terms are going to be coming much more frequently into your realm. In the coming weeks, you'll probably see it by the end of today. Um, change is coming, and the speed at which change is happening is phenomenal. They are saying that two weeks, an algorithm, an algorithm is out of, out of purpose. In two weeks, the change is happening that quickly. I'm deeply interested in navigating these waters. The, the conversation around embodiment and how AI is appropriating our physicality. And there is little legislation directing the deployment of AI and practically no regulation. At the point of creating algorithms, data art architects are not bound to consider ethics and guidelines are only just being discussed and debated. Does our field need to develop its own policies, regulations and codes of practice? I will answer this question simply by saying a resounding yes, because otherwise we will be in reactionary mode. How do we do it? On the flip side, I do think there are remarkable things happening because of the dispersal of, of access that technology brings us. Initiatives in this area of AI need to be inclusive from their inception, because the negation of this is already showing up in society at large, with racial and gender biases compounding. We do not need to repeat this in dance. I repeat, we do not need to repeat this in dance. In our case, we should seek out AI solutions to serve those with the least access to influence. Those who are at the financial margins, and children should be central to any frameworks that we create. Now, if we do this, then this will truly be disruptive technology, shaped to empower those who have the smallest voice. Take a moment for yourself. Who is that for you in your organization? Who is that for you in your community? Let's take this on board with the immediacy and vigor within this sustainable goal. 
in regard to other imminent uses of existing algorithms. There are data science companies that are already seeking to diversify the deployment of their technologies. And they are marketing products designed for one purpose and then deploying them in other industries. Blue chip companies have their marketing professionals ready to sell you their biased technologies, to relieve you of your pain points, to help you with your bottom line and your burnout. What comes after this, logically, over time, how much or how little, it's impossible to know. Artists and larger organizations with access will then seek out other machine learning technologies marketed to them to enable them to produce grant applications that are more likely to be positively assessed by foundations machine learning instruments. The beginning of this is already visible through college application processing. A valid question is, will the machine learning technologies use inclusive data sets that have variation to teach these machines to recognize the value of producing a diverse shortlist? Or will we end up circling back to a place where equity is only superficially addressed in dance? This place that we're seeking to move on from. How the technologies coined as allegedly disruptive steer us? How, with machine learning, coming near to replicating the diligent and deeply committed selection process of the Dance USA fellows? How will machine learning do what you've just done? We heard in, in the presentation how thorough that process, how informed it was. How will machine learning become even close to that without our input in terms of the design of these processes. In short, we have to be critically engaged. Or else those on the margins will forever be, and the status quo will be safeguarded. It's rather like the current situation where technologies are deployed to, to collect biometric data at borders, ensuring politically undesirable, undesirable people or families are permanently, permanently shunned. This artificial intelligence machine learning transition needs a watchful and wakeful approach. It is guaranteed to produce bias if we are simply consumers. And there will be many institutions for which this will be true. Think of local government arts funding and how this will be engaged, adopting new technologies to reduce labor-intensive exercises like reviewing grant applications. No doubt there are positive aspects. Artificial intelligence, the generative and the predictive, enable us to expand our networks, the reach of our work, sending it far afield to be intercepted by people we could have never imagined. But are we going to be ahead of the curve, in, uh, able to curate ways to involve a cross-section of our artists, audiences, patrons, to be co-conceivers in designing systems that institutions will use? Let's go forward with an informed intention to make possibility and not containment for people experiencing dance. Let's take a lead in advising local governments arts funders nationally and in initiate specific dialogue on this topic with foundations. Even if we don't have all of the information, it really is coming to us in pieces. Through the efficacy and efficiency that these technologies seemingly offer, my caution is to be critical, skeptical, and have a variety of interests at the table. Before incisive turns are taken, to take these assistive technologies to ensure that they are for good, enabling artists who seek to bring humanity into its feeling state. For artists, we are curious, and new tools offer us the opportunity to create something new for audiences. Let's focus on how to use these tools beyond the factor of awe, and consider how our data are then being deployed. Let's be clear. As dancers, we have access to a movement and sensory intelligence system 
that they do not. Few other groups have this intelligence. Let's question where this data is going when we collaborate with Google on a movement-based data architecture. Currently, Google work with DARPA, and our technology could be feeding the machines that are moving towards weaponry. Would you opt to do this by choice, or would you prefer that your data is supporting biomedical research, building rehabilitation technologies, and so on? Let's be aware of where our data is being funneled, and seek to be invited to seat at the table, to be seated at the table before research is deployed. That is seemingly shiny and exciting. Our bodily innovations hold the capacity to enable humanity to have more empathy with each other, as well as other sentient life and life-enabling elements on our planet. We have the mind-body technology to generate joy and wellness. Through a variety of practices, we can increase our resilience. Aha! Resilience. This brings me back. To improvisation, improvisation as a practice, and dare I say it, discipline helps us to develop resilience. Due to our life experiences, our disciplinary backgrounds, and our mutable personalities, we may show up to the same circumstances in very different ways. Would you agree that we would show up to the same circumstances in very different ways? There's good purpose in this. Thank you, because we need difference. We all the time need to, to to explore beyond what we know, and understanding the paradigm of improvisation through embodiology's culturally and aesthetically inclusive approach, the capacity to positively engage with the unknown is optimized. Such that we can develop more resilience to engage with the inevitability of change. Let's think of resilience as the ability to bounce back from adversity. Adversity being on a scale. For example, in one day it could be any small number of catastrophes, from not being able to find your keys and being late for work, realizing that your organization is not going to meet its fundraising target, to sustaining an injury for which you have no healthcare coverage. Skills embedded with improvisation enable us not only to recover from ad adversity but to move forwards to new possibilities. According to Adam Grant, who, with Sheryl Sandberg, wrote the book Option B: Facing Adversity, Building Resilience, and Finding Joy, they affirm that there's a naturally learnable set of behaviors that contribute to resilience. Scientists studying stress align resilience with strength. With strengthening one's emotional muscles, at any time it is possible to take intentional steps towards building resilience before a big or small crisis hits. Here I align the six major milestones that they mapped out with embodiology. Practicing optimism is something that requires repetition, dynamic rhythm. Fractal code is looking into what currently exists and recognizing ways that it can be revised, revi rewriting your story. Don't personalize it. Play in decision making. Consider this too will change. This too will pass. It's okay to do so intentionally. Support others. Collaborative competition. The Latin root of the word is competere. Which means to sustain together. So move in alliance to enable you to sustain your efforts. Take stress breaks. Check in with yourself. Inner sensing and balance. Make it a daily practice to de-stress by simply engaging first with your breath. Go out of your comfort zone. Connect that with your audience. Listen to people that you serve, even if this feels uncomfortable at first. They're on your side. Give them new ways to engage in sharing with you, and reward them. 
So, is this something that you'd like to do? I've just given you a, a brief introduction into these embodiology concepts and their application in real life, let's say. But they're both they're best understood experientially. So, in order to do that, we're going to participate in an activity which is going to frame some rewiring of your brain. We're going to focus on dynamic rhythm, which is the meta principle of embodiology. And we will experience connection to our brain and connection our, connecting our body, our, our, our minds. It's a dual task, which involves maybe three tasks. And the outcome is hemispheric balancing of your brain. So, let us be ready. You may stand, you may stay seated. It's probably good to action through standing if you're able. We are going to engage with what I call the bell pattern. This object is called a gankakui. And this object is an Eve bell. And there is a central rhythm that finds its way into this pattern. And it is the circulatory system that keeps all of the many layers of rhythm going. So I would like you to clap this as soon as you can hear it. This pattern. Keep going. Now, I want you to find the subterranean rhythms. I want you to walk with me. Keep clapping. Excellent. Now breathe. Yes. Keep going. Keep going. I'm going to show you the triplet. So it's more circular. What I'm going to do with my feet, pattern-wise, is a triplet. Good. Breathe. Everything gets better when you breathe. That was incredibly successful. Yes. So, there we have it. The beginnings of understanding time in multiple layers. Our experience of rhythm in dance is usually subjected to, ta to, to, to counting as opposed to feeling. Yeah. So, I'm going to finish there. And I uh, thank you for listening and considering these ideas. Thank you. I'm not sure, but maybe we have time for one or two questions. If there's anyone who has anything that's pressing. Yes, no, maybe. Need more information? Yes, there's a question up there, great. Interesting. 
Hi. Um, I was wondering, you said about talking to foundations. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what you said, but about technology and, and dance. Could you talk a little bit more specifically about what you meant and how we can do that? I think I'm thinking about the, a long-range picture in which these technologies are inevitably going to be part of analyzing any written data. And organizations are already doing this to assess worthiness. And I was speaking to college admissions. These programs are already, these software are already being used. I, I doubt whether foundations are using them yet, but they will be. At some point, that change will happen. And there's no telling at this point when that will happen. But I can say there's a gold rush happening and there's a fierceness in getting advantage, right? So people will be selling these, these technologies, whether they've been really tested and, and become fully um, uh, appropriate for a particular industry. The, the regulation really isn't there yet. So I think there needs to be conversation initiated so that when these technologies are being brought forward that we are discerning. Does that help? Yeah? So it's, it's not happening necessarily next month, but in three years' time, it may be. You know, local government, they, they bring in technologies at a, a different rate, right? The small organizations are likely to be those that will be expected to just adopt what is already at play. And so my, my provocation is, can we get into the conversation ahead of time so that our considerations and other art forms are really considered as opposed to just adopting and having to fit into whatever that new norm is? Because it's not going to be positive if we do that. We need to be part of the development of technologies that are going to impact our lives. Yeah. So I think Dance USA may have a role to play in that, I would think. Um, Amare, I, Dr. Amare, I appreciate the multiplicity of entry points and the various ways we think about industry, field, discipline, and the breadth of the work. I think it's really helpful uh, to contextualize this present moment, the past moment, and the future moment. And it's from that space that I'm entering this question around archive, mm -hmm. the body as an archive, this artifice that we're sitting in right now as maybe an archival structure. And I'm thinking about, you know, Roman, or we think about, you know, the Yoruba traditions and how we think about performance, these performance spaces. And we're no longer enter, we're no longer in those spaces, like these major arenas, right? There's an evolution, theatrical spaces like this, as an evolution. And I'm curious in your mind as we look forward a hundred years from now, you know, we're in 2120. What does that archive look like? What does that, what, if you had to imagine, for instance, based off of what you've set up for us, what is the body archive? What is the role of dance in, um, in that 2120? What does that look like? And I think you mentioned some of that earlier, and I was just curious, what are some other things that have been percolating for you as it relates to embodyology? Huh. Um, as far as, I, I'm really going to go from my own corridor, because um, I can't really speak for the whole of dance. Um, and that is, is um, a dancer, a dancer that has full agency. When I mean, what I mean by that, that has received wisdom from many different technologies, techniques, but they themselves have the capacity to create, to be that powerful voice. Um, and that uh, process of, uh, of ownership of that, that vessel that is their own body, not being prescribed as being a tool for 
someone else's display, but it in itself is simply ready and is reflective of histories, but it's also able to speak now for every dancer. Um, that, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a wish, uh, a proclamation that dancers have that assurity, that confidence, and are not subject to being subjugated. Yes. Yes. Maybe one last question? Oh, we have to... Oh, one last question, one last question. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your work with us all. I really, really appreciate it. My question is, um, as someone who is disabled, a disabled choreographer, I use improv as an entryway to my work for physically integrated dance. A lot of us do, actually. And you talked a lot about improv. Um, so my question is, how can we, as a field, incorporate more physically integrated dance into into improv world and see it as not just, like going back to the rigor idea that you mentioned, how do we kind of emphasize that in our field of physically integrated dance as rigor and not just adaptability or transferring or transposing? How do we show the rest of the dance world that our work is just as rigorous yeah. as their work? Yeah, we, well, we have to state it. We have to state it with, with, with conviction and also know that improvisation is the engine that has fueled all of the dance advancement that we see. Improvisation is that fuel, that creativity, that, that development of a new idea. It comes from somewhere, it comes, it's informed, but that moment of innovation that comes through improvisation, that is the fuel. And I think understanding and articulating that, um, making it transparent as well. Um, and I think as improvisers, we need to, we need to get together in, in, the, in the broadest sense, because improvisation for, for, for many people has been sort of defined by a postmodern uh, trajectory, but that's just part of the space. It's a, it's a space that's been developed, but there's, there's a whole swathe of other types of dancers that engage in improvisation, and that is substantial. So I think part of it is us connecting and making, making opportunities, making festivals, making platforms that foreground, that demonstrate the, the rigor, the articulation, and the wisdom, and the power and the beauty and everything else that comes with being real and owning that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you.